father put down his knife. I don't know of any law that says they can't talk. Maybe if we didn't give them so much to talk about, they'd be quiet. Why don't you drink your coffee, Scout? I was playing in it with the spoon. I thought Mr. Cunningham was a friend of ours. You told me a long time ago he was. He still is. But last night he wanted to hurt you. Atticus placed his fork beside his knife and pushed his plate aside. Mr. Cunningham's basically a good man, he said. He just has his blind spots along with the rest of us. Jem spoke. Don't call that a blind spot. He'd have killed you last night when he first went there. He might have hurt me a little, Atticus conceded. But son, you'll understand folks a little better when you are older. A mob's always made up of people, no matter what. Mr. Cunningham was a part of a mob last night, but he was still a man. Every mob in every little southern town is always made up of people, you know. Doesn't say much for them. Does it? I'll say not, said Jem. So it took an eight-year-old child to bring him to their senses, didn't it? Said Atticus. That proves something. That a gang of wild animals can be stopped simply because they are still human. Hmm. Maybe we need a police force of children. You children last night made Walter Cunningham stand in my shoes for a minute. That was enough. Why did you bring this particular book this evening and why did you read that particular passage from this book? This is um, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Mm. And this has been a book that I read first, I think, when I was about 14, 15, and didn't understand much at the time. But I read it again and probably a few times more. Um, when I was in my 20s and around that time I had come to realize of I've seen growing up even as a child a lot of mobs in action mm. in our country mm. I've seen war I've seen a lot of killing but I also studied conflict resolution and dispute resolution um, for my higher studies and so I was looking at a human angle of how um, you know, how to resolve conflicts and what makes people resort to violence. Quite ordinary, normal people to get out there and create all sorts of horrendous uh, things to do things like that. And um, yeah, and then rereading it, I think I kind of understood. And it has been sort of, uh, how do I say, like my connection of realizing that I had also grown up, the point that I understood that I understand where it comes from mm. I also realized okay I've grown up so I'm, I'm very attached to it and I read it quite often reread <laughs> Ms. Bhemsara Premaratna thank you so much for being my artist uh, this evening you are an actress on stage and on the screen you're a singer uh, we hear your voice whenever we uh, go grocery shopping and on the phone as well but uh, who is the person behind all those titles? Who really is Bhimsara Prem Ratna? Mm, I am many things, but I'm also um, very like every other person, I think, in the sense that I have the similar likes and dislikes. I have, I desire more or less the same things like most other human beings, you and I. But, um, if you want to single me out, I would think that uh, how you can single me out is that I have a very strong desire, if you will call it ambition, to do something of service. That could be art, that could be science, it could be social work, activism, mm. anything. But the driving force behind me is to do something of service. So I think I have found my calling with the arts. Mm. So whether it's performing, um, reading, voicing, anything, you know, all of that. Um, 
where I feel there are gaps, I find other ways of doing that. So I, I wear a lot of hats mm. because of that. Um, because I feel like, okay, I'm, I can do more. I can serve more. Mm. So, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. As an actress, what is your greatest fear? I can't really say one, if I'm honest. I think if, yeah, if, if I'm to say one great fear, I, I would say it is not bringing out the character to its fullest potential, mm. not being convincing or not really being that person, looking like the actor acting the person. I think that is like the greatest fear. Mm. I'm terrified of watching myself like after work, like even for a playback, I, I, yeah, that's, that's, that's always a bit of a fear. I do it. I mean, you mm. have to, mm. um, but, uh, yeah, I think that that would be the greatest fear. Have you encountered that fear within you or? A few times, a few times I feel, I felt that I, I could have done that better or I, I mean, the circumstances and everything, I mean, it takes a village to shoot mm -hmm. anything, but, uh, or even theater for that matter. I have had occasion to think that. A lot of others have said, no, it's not the case, you've, you've done fine, but mm -hmm. I think I could have done better. As an actress, what is your greatest accomplishment? There are a few, I mean, it, it's always, uh, I think, um, quite, I don't know, it, it fills you up inside, I think, when you have, um, you win awards, when you get uh, favorable criticism from, like, the critics and so on. But for me, like, um, just now, recently, at, at the moment, there is one teledrama that I, um, uh, that I appeared in that's re-telecast these days. Mm -hmm. And just on the v day of the very first episode, I got a message from someone. Mm -hmm. um, this is now? This is now. Okay. So this originally was broadcast uh, eight years ago? Yeah, Nine 2012. Years ago. 12, 2012, nine years ago. And um, then, so this is someone who had watched it then, mm. who had and that was my first teledrama, so they had not n known me from, like, you know, before. So they had looked for me, and then they had uh, remembered. So there was this long sort of, almost like a love letter type of, uh, and it's not to me, it's more to the character. Okay. Um, but it really, like, I think, what, to me, was, was the biggest kind of uh, achievement that, you know, someone can really get the character and sort of um, not resonate but maybe um, get attached to mm. the character in that way mm. um, that they don't really even understand who I am nor do they care mm. that they don't really see that you're even a different person to mm. them you are that you know so you know you've done your job as an actor that you've delivered so the character overcome through. your fear as well yes very much <laughs> How important is voice to an actor? To me, it is as important as being physically there and the expression. So I always think of three things when I approach a character. Once you get down all your sort of um, your framework as to the age, the appearance, all of that, da da da. What I would look at is like, on one hand, the mannerisms of that person. How would, like their gestures to all of that. Then what are their expressions? You know, there are certain ways that a particular person would express their happiness or joy or misery or terror. To each of us, that's unique, you know? So I need to, I would explore where do I find that or how would I like identify that? Then the third thing is voice, the vocal range. And again, if you get angry, how would you express it through voice? How would you like, you know, if you don't have the outlet of your mannerisms, your physical being, and you don't have the outlet of your expressions, your face, but if it's just voice, how would you deliver? So balancing the three 
is important to me. You can't, unless your character is supposed to be mute or something like that. Mm. You cannot, you mm. cannot overlook it. To me, it's paramount. Mm. One unforgettable moment in your acting career can be either bad or good. Um, there are quite a number. I will relate quite shortly to one didn't happen to me, but this was way back when we were in school. And um, so we were at a girl's school and this um, friend of mine on stage with me. Uh, we were performing a comedy to a public audience, largely f full of schoolboys. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, at one point, though, although it's a comedy, it wasn't funny at this particular point. But mm. then the entire um, audience started, like, you know, there was like a titter of like mm. laughter and then it mm. grew and grew and grew and then there was a huge laughter and we could not figure out and we were all on like four of us are on stage and we are like our dialogues are going on and we just couldn't figure out what and um, to see my particular friend her zip was undone and she obviously we were all playing male characters and uh, and um, yeah it was both terrifying as well as comic at the time. Mm. And I was glad that it wasn't me. I wouldn't know what I would have done. But my friend recovered quite fast. She just turned around while on stage, pulled it up, turned back again, and went straight to perform. So yeah, it was, it was hilarious and memorable. And yeah, one of those really big moments, I think, in the school performing life. Mm. The second one is um, for this particular teledrama that is being uh, broadcast these days, Apache. And um, so in that, there is one scene where um, my character confronts uh, her father. And there's um, one scene, it's, it's more or less like the climax of their relationship. And um, where she really goes out at him and uh, he's not a father who believes in violence or punishment or any of that. He's, he's approach to parenting is very different, very loving and very, um, uh, very different to, you know. Um, so he, um, he slaps her. And this scene we shot um, on the eve of my birthday that year. Over and over again, and there's, I mean, it's a big scene. There's a lot of like art direction changes to happen as well, where like, you know, I topple a bookcase and like all sorts of things. So we shot this overnight. We started around six o'clock that evening and we went on till like 5.30 or 6 the next Don't time. tell me that this was an actual slap. It was, um, and not because we couldn't cheat it, but because I think by the time Jackson, Anthony and I, we could take the shot we were both tired i think <laughs> and it was it was just happened over and over it wasn't i mean it was not like a thundering slap it mm -hmm. looked like a thundering slap on screen but uh, it wasn't but yeah to you know <laughs> to go through that on the eve of my birthday and i think that was that was probably one of the best scenes uh, we achieved as well so that's yeah name one similarity between English theatre and Sinhala theatre in Sri Lanka and one difference? I think there are more similarities than differences. I, 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 on principle, I hate to sort of differentiate the two mm. as, as um, on principle, simply because we're both trying to do the same thing. Um, you're trying to tell a story through the medium of stage. And whichever language you say it to me, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, but in terms of if you really want to pick for a difference, um, there are two, two very significant differences. One is that English theatre is largely made of non-professional actors. They don't get paid. Mm. Um, not necessarily that they are, their performance quality. I mean the fact that they, are, they don't get paid. They don't paid, do so it for a living. Living. Mm. Whereas most of uh, singular theatre is that, that mm. people who are professionally doing, unless you are doing it for your university mm. or school. Um, the second difference I see is with the audiences. Um, the singular theatre audiences are, I feel, they have a broad range. Mm. 
they have a palette for a broader range. Mm -hmm. They, from comedies to tragedies to um, more modern drama to all of that, there is, you could always find an audience. Mm -hmm. For English theatre, as, I mean, as far as I know, we've been in existence since like the 40s, if we trace back to the Lionel mm -hmm. Went times. But even so, we still haven't been able to achieve a, a broad range of theatre. It's only certain genres that work, that mm. can bring audiences, that mm. can sell out, mm. you know. Um, and there are a number of reasons. We can have like a whole other discussion about that another day, but I, I Name those one. Are, I think the fact that there is, um, for the English audiences, you can, at a click or at just, uh, at a, by just traveling to another country, you can see mm. English theatre productions at a very high quality um, outside and it's, it's easily accessible to them. Mm. So there is no need mm. as, per se to, you know, to watch it here. For example, if you're doing a musical of, um, say, Andrew Lloyd Webber, um, you could easily go to Singapore and watch it mm. or go, you can easily go to Delhi and watch it. Mm. And there are, there are world class uh, mm. uh, and, and the audiences that come to watch theatre in Colombo can um, easily afford to do that. Mm. Um, and this is something we need to think about and we need to work around and we need to find what is palatable or what is, mm -hmm. uh, or create interest in some way. Amateur theatre directors slash producers, should they pay their actors? I think they should try. Why? Because that is one way of trying to make it a professional, professionally functioning institution, let's say. Yeah. Um, see, and this, this is my, one of my critiques about the cinema here as well, that we have not made it, made, grown it into an industry. It is still done in a very ad hoc, very haphazard style. Someone wants to do a play, someone wants to do a film mm. because they really want to do it. It's a test of like their determination when something actually comes out, you know. Mm. It's not, and it shouldn't be that way. It, it should be something that is, has, has, you know, you have the framework already in place, mm. especially after like so many years of, 70 odd years of cinema, uh, God knows how long of theatre mm. and all of those functions should be in place. And if you do at least start thinking about paying the actors, then you are already sort of solidifying their place in the theatre. Mm. A lot of them can't afford to, you know, spend time there because, you know, they have other work mm. and uh, you can't compromise. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've faced that struggle myself. I, I mean, I was doing a full-time job and then I quit completely to sort of dedicate to my career in the arts and I, I mean, I went bankrupt. Um, I had, I hit rock bottom and I had to sort of, you know, build myself up, took a long time, but, you know, I, I know where it comes from. So I think, he, yeah, if it's a good start. Coming back to your uh, on-screen presence, you had the fortune uh, of acting with a legend in the industry, like you mentioned earlier, Jackson Anthony, in your first appearance uh, in a teledrama. How was it? Were you intimidated at any point? For sure. Um, when I first met him on set, I think it was the very first day that I went on. To say, oh, actually, no. Um, we shot the first segment, like most of uh, my uh, scenes abroad were shot in Netherlands. Mm. And um, so my first sort of experience was just with the um, director of photography, Damik Ratnaika, and the director, Ananda Benaika, the three of us um, abroad. And then, so about a week of shooting there and come back. And then um, we were, the set was in Dabulla. And uh, when I went, uh, Jackson was there at the set. And um, yeah, I mean, I was scared. <laughs> Um, but also not, not just of him, there was everyone else. I, I think I was the only one who was new. Mm. Um, I was the only fresh face. Everyone else had been 
even the small children had appeared in something or the other before that. Mm. For me, it was just stage bef mm. uh, prior to that. So it was, um, yeah, I mean, Chandani Saniviratna to Lushan Bulat Singhala to Priyaran Singha to, I mean, yeah, they have, they had everybody. Uh, it was a huge cast, I think easily about 150 to 200 people um, in all of uh, 65 or 70 episodes. Mm. Um, yeah, I was scared, but he was a fantastic guru mm. in that sense. He was very welcoming and uh, he put me at ease. I think on the very first day, or no, the second day itself, we had a big scene, just him and I. And, um, and then he helped direct that scene as well, almost, mm. and uh, you know, really put me at ease and mm. eternally grateful. You brought up a very important point. Uh, as actors, uh, somewhere down the line, some person will have a breakthrough performance. How important is it not to doubt yourself, knowing that you are good amidst you know, celebrities and big stars? I, I mean, for me, I didn't know whether I was good. For me, I, I had no idea where I was in the spectrum, honestly. Mm -hmm. For me, it was just that an opportunity was at hand. And it was something I had never done. Um, but it was something I'd like to do. And so it was like just a leap of faith. And hoping that you land somewhere, anywhere. Mm. Um, but if you're really passionate about performing, if you're really passionate about, and I, I don't think even it, it's, it's just even for performing, for anything in life, I think you need to um, overcome that fear, uh, fear of doubting and, and sort of throw yourself into whatever it is that you like to do. Um, for success, I, I have like a mantra. I think always of three things. One is that I am I genuinely talented at something mm. um, and if I am then I have uh, a fairly good chance of uh, achieving success at it. Um, secondly I may be good at it mm -hmm. but I may not like doing it, I may not enjoy it. Um, so that is important as well if you are choosing to do something on a long-term basis you know like a career. And thirdly could you sustain yourself doing it? You could l love it with like all your might, you could um, enjoy it and you could be the most talented person. But if you can't have your basic necessities looked after, if you can't make a, you know, make a living either through it or you have some other kind of support, mm -hmm. either way, if you're not sustained, if, you're, if you can't survive, then, then you can't do it. You will start hating it at some point. So if those three things work, then you're good to go. So for me, it's like every time I'm faced with an opportunity, I think, am I genuinely good at it? Do I think I'm good at it? And do I really want to do it? Mm. And then how can I make this work for the long term? Mm. So all those three, three things eventually worked out. What is the place of women in Sri Lankan cinema at present? I think um, things are picking up. Hmm. If you were to ask me that question in another five years, the answer would be very different. That things would be like such a roaring success that I don't think you would have to ask that question. Things are underfoot. Things are looking up. Things are getting better. A lot of uh, there are a lot of young girls who are, you know, shooting with their mobile phones, shooting with their, um, you know, going to film school, um, looking at opportunities. Um, and not just, I, I think performing had been limited to, like, has been the, limit, the one role that most women did. Um, but now there are a lot of them who are behind the camera, who are doing... Um, from ADs to sound engineers to DOPs and directors and producers and so on. So it's, um, it's growing. It's, it's, um, it's looking very hopeful. How important is art and craft in our education system? It is 
one of the, I mean, not one, I think it is the most important thing to me, mm. at least from where I see things. I think it's very, very important. Um, simply because um, there is a lot of learning that you get through the arts, through performing or through expressing. This is the one area that you are able to truly express yourself, whether you do it through visual art, like sculptures or painting or whatever else, or you perform. And performing has the additional advantage that it builds up your confidence. You are able to communicate in front of thousands of people, hundreds of people, um, with with some conviction. Mm. And that that's that's not something that's very difficult to achieve through anything else. Mm. Sports can maybe compete with mm. that, and I think sports is important too. But um, creative expression, I think, especially for Sri Lankans, where I think a lot of us have been muted through our education system. We only know to ask certain questions. We don't even know what questions to ask. We don't, we will accept the answers that are given to us and not think a thought beyond that. And that has to change for society to grow, for things to thrive, for, you know, whatever better change to happen. So arts is the way to go. I'm going to name a few names and uh, a few words and okay. then uh, tell me the first word that comes to your mind okay. when I say so. I will try to restrict it to one word. I okay. will try. Jackson Anthony. Brilliant. Ashandas. Difficult to restrict him to one word. Um, challenging and endearing. Dharma Predas. Okay, my struggle is to find this one word, right? If you want, um, okay, I will just describe. Daya, as we call him, is phenomenal. He is, um, all kinds of wonderful, and he's uh, one of the most down-to-earth, most uh, real actors I have ever met. Ananda Benayaka. Guru, hmm. Apache, um, yeah, father figure. Rajita Desanayaka. Another father figure, but I will also go on to add uh, He is, again, mm, tough. He's one of the most um, genuine artists, mm -hmm. I would say, that I've encountered. His soul is in his craft. Mm. Yeah. Chandran Ratnam. Dramatic mm -hmm. and inspirational. Kausha Fernando. Idol. Pasan Ranavira. Oh, good friend. <laughs> Shyam Fernando. Brilliant actor, good friend, and an inspiration. School. Hmm. Greatest love. But also, uh, also one of the toughest loves, I think, I've had. This one, I'm glad it's only restricted to a few words. <laughs> it's, it's restricted to one word. <laughs> Taming of the shoe. A lot of fun. Hmm. The Lionel went. Home. Marriage. A question mark. Love. In us and around us, always. Life. Is to explore. Ms. Bhimsara Prairanathan, thank you so much for taking your time and uh, coming here as my artist 
for tonight. Been an absolute pleasure, Tarusha. Thank you. Likewise. But uh, just before I go, I would like to conclude uh, today's program with your charming voice. Yeah. Here we go. In a flash, Atticus was up and standing over him. Jim buried his face in Atticus's shirt front. Shh, he said. I think that was her way of telling you. Everything's all right now, Jim. Everything's all right. You know, she was a great lady. A lady? Jim raised his head. His face was scarlet. After all those things she said about you, a lady? She was. She had her own views about things. A lot different from mine, maybe, some. I told you that if you hadn't lost your head, I'd have made you go read to her. I wanted you to see something about her. I wanted you to see what real courage is, instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand. It's when you know you are licked before you begin, but you begin anyway, and you see it through no matter what. You rarely win, but sometimes you do. Mrs. Dubois won all 98 pounds of her. According to her views, she died beholden to nothing and nobody. She was the bravest person 